were all gathered, and I wasn't a technical fellow at the time. And so I said, you know, who this guy? I said, you know, and this is a pretty smart guy. Or, or I said, I, somebody that affected somebody's experience hands. I know that guy. He's not that smart. <laughs> anyway, so, so that's not the point. Does anybody in anybody in the room have have some secrets more worth protecting than this guy? Or a bigger budget to protect secrets than this guy, right? And that's the real question, right? And the answer is, of course, no. None of you have secrets more important th than his secrets. None of you have anywhere near the budget that this guy has to protect those secrets. I just guarantee you that. Okay, so that's one guy. Now, in the other corner, we have this guy, Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, 30-year-old college dropout, okay? So, gentlemen, to your corners. Michael Hayden went and made a decision that each one of us make every single day. In fact, we make it every single day uh, so often that we don't even think about it. It's just a normal course of business. And yet it was a decision, a singular decision, that if he could go back and change one thing in his life, I guarantee you this was the one decision he would change. <laughs> He gave that guy admin privileges to his systems. And that was a bad choice. Right? And the reason, of course, is that admins have the keys to the kingdom. right? So if you're not familiar with the details, Edward Snowden was an admin to the NSA systems. He uh, got uh, access to SharePoint. And of course, as an admin in SharePoint, you need to be able to create admin, you know, SharePoint sites, delete them, etc. But as a SharePoint admin, as an admin, he was also able to read the contents of a SharePoint site. And what he did was he read them and he copied them all to a disk and of course took them away and the rest is history. Okay? The question is why did he have access to read them? Right? That was a bad choice. And here's the real answer. The real answer is that, again, sort of not really thinking about it. You know, 40 or 50 years ago, some guy had this invention, and it turned out to be a really bad invention, although we didn't know it at the time. And he invented this thing called admin, right? <laughs> and admin, like, well, you know, do all these things, and then, well, then there's this one guy, and we're just going to trust that guy, and he can do anything. Turns out that was a terrible decision, okay? <laughs> anyway, that, but here's the thing. Why? Because admins have the key to the kingdom. Right? And that's why a 30-year-old dropout was able to just totally destroy the life and reputation of some guy who had more money than God to protect his <laughs> secrets. Okay? One decision. Okay, so now, here, in, in, in like irony, you know, pure irony, one of the documents that he published was literally, literally titled Hunting Systems, Hunting and Hacking System Admins. And in it, it said, who better to target than the person that has the keys to the kingdom? So basically, the NSA was saying, hey, we are going after you. Not people like you. I mean you. Now, why are they going after you? Are you a bad guy? Are you connected with Al-Qaeda? Are you somehow involved with the mafia or some nefarious thing? And the answer is no. But you have something they want. You have access to the systems that they want, and they want it all. Now, whether it's NSA or Chinese or the mafia or the Russian, blah, whoever, they all have the same model. They're all after you because you have something incredibly important, and that is admin privileges. So you are being hunted. Make no, if you walk away with nothing but that one fact, walk away with that fact. Let me just give you an example. Last night, I do a lot of patents, like a lot of patents. And uh, these patents often take a while, and often at Microsoft we farm out things to, to third parties. So I got this mail from somebody, you know, lawyers, and they said, hey, we've been contracted by Microsoft LCA, there's been one of your patents, had, we going through the details, and the documents weren't signed, attached are where they are, you know, here's the attachment, please uh, you know, uh, print them out, sign them, and send them to us. I said, no. No, I don't know you. Who are you? And that all sounds right, probably is right, but I don't know you. So I said, you have to go through our legal department 
and you have our legal department send me those documents. I'm not clicking on a document from somebody I don't know. So you talk to them, if this is legitimate, they'll send the documents to me. And that's the kind of situational awareness I want you to begin to foster, right? Because you are being targeted. I'm definitely being targeted, right? So you gotta be conscious of these things. Okay, now, <clears throat> that's the point. Admins are an attack surface. Often we think about attack services in terms of like network ports and you know physical access, you know, etc. But no, the people are an attack surface as well, and you need to think about it that way. So admins, of course, we need administrators, right? But uh, you know, look, we make mistakes. You know, here's the thing I'm worried about. I'm pretty sensitive to this this issue of of the admin privileges, so I didn't click on that document. But that, that person, whoever it was, sent it to about half a dozen people. I guarantee you one of them clicked on that document. And if it was legitimate, everything's fine. And if it's illegitimate, that person is now owned. Okay? So, dangerous. Uh, and sometimes they're bad actors, right? Sometimes they go against, whether you think Snow is a good guy or a bad guy, I can guarantee you Michael Hayden, who had all the assets, considers him a bad actor. He did not uh, use those assets in the way Michael Hayden wanted him to use them. Uh, but they're always part of the attack surface. So, if you just stopped and thought about it, wouldn't it be great if somehow people didn't need to do, have admin privileges to do their job? Like they can just get their job done and they don't have to add admin privileges. So if you get hacked, like okay, but no big deal. You don't have admin privileges. But it'd be great that, now, when, not if, when a machine gets popped, it didn't leak high value credentials. So if you're not aware of the typical phenomena, what happens is, okay, so I have this machine, somehow they crack my machine, right? They fish me, they get my credentials, they pop this machine. Now they have admin rights on this machine. Using this Mimicats that you saw the other day, they can then harvest all the credentials on that machine. And there's typically some admin credentials. Now if there aren't, what they'll do is they'll make something break on the system. Why do they do that? Well, they make something break on the system, so I say, dang. And I get on the help desk and they say, help desk, can you help me? And the help desk, with admin privileges, logs onto the system to repair my system. Now they got those admin privileges. And using those admin privileges, they go out to other machines and other machines and other machines, and they do it over and over and over again. And it's called spidering. So they spider their way through the network. So the point is that when, not if, machines are gonna get popped. That's the thing you have to know. They are gonna get popped. Let's say own. Wouldn't it be great if, when they got popped, they didn't leak high value credentials? Wouldn't it be great if people were only able to do the things they were supposed to do? And then lastly, wouldn't it be great if all administrative actions got logged, right? So that you can go and you can say, hey, something weird happened here, what happened? And you're able to see who did what, when, and then go ask them about that. So that'd be a pretty good world. Well, that is, so here's, that's what we're trying to build, okay? Now, let's take the scenario. You're there, you're in charge, you hire this bright young guy, seems like he's got a good resume, uh, and you make him an admin. Okay, and here's your server, it's got some gold, and uh, he then tries to um, RDP into that server. Says, oh, no, you can't do that. So he comes to me and he says, hey, Jeffrey, uh, I need to be an admin, right? Comes to the, the hero of the story. He says, Jeffrey, I need to be the admin on the server uh, to restart DNS. And of course our server says, hey, Eddie, no, no, no. You, that's not the way we do things in our shop. You just use PowerShell to connect to that server. So now he Ed, uses PowerShell. He says, enter PS session, dollar sign server one. He's able to restart DNS. Happy days. Everything's good. Yeah? Good. Yeah. Now Eddie goes and tries to execute the steel secrets command. That's a special command. You can get it on the PowerShell gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets this nice error message. Error, you are not authorized to steal secrets, okay? <laughs> and, and, of course, and of course, that action was logged, and so the next step is I call up the police and say, I'd, I'd like you to talk, introduce you to my new admin. <laughs> okay, so basically now what we're trying to do here is to minimize security exposure, okay? So think about it this way. There's capability and then there's time. 
And so what does that mean? So it says, okay, I just hired you, Eddie, and I give you admin privileges. What does that mean? You got a lot of capabilities. If I give you domain admins, you have everything, okay? And then you're an admin. So you're an admin. You're an admin from the time I give you the privileges until I find out you screwed something up and I fire you, or chances are I fire you, but then I forget to disable your account so you have it forever, right? So, you know, you have, that's a lot of exposure. So time times, you want to think about your exposure, security exposure, is capability times time. So what we want to do is we have something called privileged identity management, or just-in-time administration. This helps address the time management. Okay, and what this does is, it's a, it's a new feature, part of Windows Server 2016, and what it does is effectively kind of sets up the shadow active directory, and basically takes away all of your admin privileges and gives them to the shadow active directory. And then, through some process, you can have lots of different processes, you say, okay, now I need to perform some admin functions on these machines. And so what it'll do is, it will give you security privileges to your SID, takes a, a, an admin uh, privilege, assigns it to your token, for a limited period of time, okay? Now, here you're gonna have a, 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 a range of granularities. As we've deployed this at Microsoft, first granularity was work hours, okay? You come in, what are your normal work hours? Monday through Friday, nine to five, great, we'll add a little slot, 8.30 to six o'clock, but that's when you get this token, right? And it's automatic. Later, we'll do a little more refined, hey, uh, which systems, when, you know, are you at lunch, etc. We want to minimize the times, but, but in order to be successful, it has to be deployable. A lot of these systems sound great, like, oh, fine-grained control, but then they're hard to implement or they're hard for people to get their job done. So you want to start off simple. So do it by, by shift. So that's how you deal with it in time. The next and the topic I'm going to talk about is just about enough administration. This addresses the capability uh, thing. So it says, instead of you being able to do any, everything, you're only able to do the things you are need to do on the systems you need to do. Okay? So, conceptually, think of it this way. Imagine, okay, so here I am, and I'm in Europe. I'm not at home. Now, my family's now taking care of everything, but if we had taken, decided, oh, I'm gonna take my family to Europe with me, combine some work business, well, all of a sudden, there's, there's stuff that needs to get done. Mail that has to get picked up. If I had a pet, someone would have to come in and feed the pet. And, and what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't say, well, hey, neighbor, um, I'm going away. Here's my keychain. You know, just, uh, just get my mail. That's no, that makes no sense. I'd say, hey, I'd like you to collect my mail take off the key for the mail, I said, this one's for you, I'm keeping the rest. If I'm gonna have you take care of my animal, I'd say, well, here's the key to the house, but the key to my BMW, I'm keeping that with me, you know, no joyriding while I'm out in Europe, okay? So it's the same thought, right? For a particular person, you assign them a particular task, and you give them the capabilities, the security capabilities, to accomplish that task and no more because you don't want the teenage next door, teenager next door joyriding in your BMW while you're out on vacation. That can be bad, okay? So, again, the model here is to do this incrementally. Like, these things are very exciting, and it's very like, oh, I'm, oh great, I'll go, you know, fine grain. No, don't do that. Like, if you can, great. If you can be successful, most people can't. Most people get very enthusiastic about these things, but then they hit the realities, and then they're like, uh, and then they stop doing it. So do this incrementally. What does that mean? Number one, if you do an audit of who has admin privileges, uh, what you'll find is that some of the systems have incredibly large systems. We have one customer that had literally tens of thousands of people with admin privileges to their servers. Now you say, well, that can't be true. No, it's really true tens of thousands of people with admin privilege to the service. So you say, well, how is that even possible? And you say, okay, well, here's how it's possible. I'm going to set up admin privileges to this machine, and instead of giving it to you, I'll give it to a group that you're in, uh, these guys. 
And then all of a sudden somebody will say, oh, well, hey, those guys are part of the soccer team. Let's put that alias on the soccer, you know, part of the soccer team. You know, isn't it? Anyway, you get included in these groups and, uh, and it explodes that way. So, so you want to audit your stuff and kind of get, number one, uh, you know, reduce. You want, if you have tens of thousands of people with admin privileges, let's get to thousands. If you have thousands, let's get to hundreds. If you have hundreds, let's get to 10, right? You don't, don't go first step to try and get to zero, right? Change the order of magnitude. Step number one, most people have, uh, give admin privileges to contractors that need to do a well-defined set of functions. Hey, contractors, you need to maintain uh, patches and, uh, and uh, restart the server. Just give them those privileges. Don't allow them to do everything. Okay, so you want to reduce the number of people with admin privileges. You want to reduce the duration they have those privileges. And you want to reduce what can be done. Again, don't go for perfection. Go for better. Land that. Be successful with that. Then go for better again. So just enough administration. This is based upon technology that we've had in since I guess probably PowerShell version two or three. We did all this work for Exchange, so you might wonder that well, you know, one is this mature technology. The answer is yes, but we used it in a special case for Exchange Online. They've been using it in production for quite a long time. And now what we've done is we've recast that and made it easier for everyone to deploy. Uh, so the simple concept is you define role capabilities. These are the set of commandlets required to support a set of activities. So it's all PowerShell based, these commands. You create an endpoint, and this is a, a, a connection endpoint where authorized users are provided the appropriate capabilities and then there's identity, okay? So this will be a little bit clearer in a second here. So what you're going to do is you're going to set up a role capability file, okay, the role capability file. In this file, you're going to define, here's the set of things that this person can do, right? Oh, contractors. Okay, well, contractors need to be able to restart the services, and they need to restart, you know, update software, and they need to reboot the server. Anything else? No. Okay, great. You define those capabilities and you create this PowerShell RC file. I don't know what that is. Restricted capability file. How's that? It's the PowerShell <laughs> restricted capability <laughs> file. Okay. Then what you do is you create a session configuration file. So session configuration file, that's how you can configure uh, remote configuration endpoints. And what you do is you point to, uh, you include this as part of that. Okay and then you register the PowerShell configuration file using this PowerShell session configuration. So you register this, which you then created, which then pointed to this. And now when you enter PS session, this session configuration um, it was registered, matches to this, we pick up these capabilities and then say, okay, now you can only do these things. Let's get more concrete. This is a role capability file. Okay, so here's it's a hash table. You see, uh, we're defining what input, what modules we're going to import. In this case, DNS server. We say what are the visible commandlets. Turns out that uh, well, the way we do this is by affecting the visibility of the commandlets. When you bring in DNS server, all the commandlets are available, and the way you make them accessible or not is by determining whether they're visible. So here you say, these are the services that are going to be available, or commandlets, get service, restart service, lots of DNS things, and you can define your own functions, okay? So here we define a function, the name is who am I, it's a script block, it gets dollar PS sender info. Now the question is, why would you do that? And the answer you'll see is that we're going to set up a uh, restricted language session, which says that there's effectively no language. So if the user wanted to find out who they were, typically you just type $PS info. They won't be able to do that because the language mode won't allow it. It's only going to allow the execution of commands. So we go and create a function to do that. Now, you can get very fine-grained. Don't want to get too complex here. But imagine you said, well, hey, I want to, like, you're doing SQL maintenance? Great, SQL maintenance. You need to restart the SQL services. But you don't need to restart any service, 
So what you can do is you can get more fine grained. It's part of these visible commandlets. Instead of just giving a value, you give a value, a string, or you can give a hash table. The hash table, what you can do is give the name of the commandlet, and then you can put restrictions on the parameters. You can say, hey, you can only do things by name, not by ID, so like processes. And here with name, you can add a validation set. Okay, so you're adding extra, all the parameter stuff that you can do when you write your script, right? Ranges, cardinality, validation <laughs> set, regular expressions. You can now add them after the fact through this mechanism. So what you're saying here is, hey, you can add, do restart service, but you can only re provide a name, which is DNS or DNS cache. How crazy is that? So now when the person connects in, they say, hey, show me what commands I have. Oh, st restart service. Oh, cool. Restart service, you know, uh, win around. No, not, not one of the allowed values. Now, this is one of the PowerShell session configuration files. This is the key thing here, a session type. Restricted remote server. This is the thing that turns off the language mode. Look, if you give them full language mode, all games are off. All bets are off. They can do anything. Okay? There's some security, but with the full language mode, they'll be able to get around it. So you got to turn off the language. There's a transcript directory that you can specify. Here, every operation, when they come in using this mechanism, every operation that they do, everything that they type and everything that gets responded back, gets stored in a file uh, underneath this directory. This, run as virtual account, this is the key thing. What this says is, you're not coming in as admin, right? You're coming in as a regular user, and then what we do is we create a virtual account on the fly with admin privileges. And this is a one-time account it's thrown away at the end of every session, recreated at the beginning of a session, thrown away at the end of the session, <coughs> has an identifier that's associated with your username, so all the logs, you can tell who it really was. Uh, but, again, you don't have uh, privileges, you just only have privileges as a virtual account. And then you have these role definitions, okay? Now the role definitions, this is where you're going to specify all the people that can log into your system and what capabilities they have, okay? So here you specify identities and groups. So you'd say, this would be like some domain group slash ntdev, that's our account, ntdev slash DNS admins. So anybody that's part of that group, you come in, you check that, and then we say, okay, what are their role capabilities? DNS maintenance. Now this DNS maintenance was the thing file that we specified earlier. What happens is that file, um, you create that as a module, right? Why as a module? Because we want to share these things amongst each other, and modules are the way you do that. So you create a module, and in that module, you've got a, a subdirectory called role capabilities, and in that is where you go and you put that file that we just created that specified the command lines, okay? So here, you're defining who, and you're defining what modules that define the role capabilities. You can have one, you can have two, you can have three. And then this is a, a hash table. So basically you can define sets of roles. Who's coming into the system? I'll say I got contractors, I got DNS administrators, and developers. Oh, three different groups of people. They have different capabilities that they can do. Okay. Did that make sense? That's the key concept. Capabilities specify these are the only things they can do. Put that in the module, put it up in the repository gallery so that everybody can see it, useful. Um, then, you, you know, it's on the system. Then you define a session configuration file. The session configuration file then maps identities, groups, etc. And again, the people in this group don't give admin privs, right? This should probably be DNS admins who don't have admin privileges. Okay. Give them users. When they come in, you're going to go and create a local virtual account with administrative privileges. They are able to perform the actions, and then the account goes away. Okay. So here is uh, one of the commandlets to do that, the new role capability file. And you see you have the ability to import files. You can define visible 
commandlets, visible aliases, visible functions. You can define external commands. Do they have access to ping? Do they have access to net sh? Okay, those external commands. Uh, do they have access to the providers? Right? Do you give them access to the file system? Yes, no. The cert drive, uh, the alias is fuck drive. Uh, scripts you can process, etc. So lots of lots of controls of the exact environment you want to give people. But again, typically, just start off with visible commandlets and visible functions, and then later you can get into the details. The session configuration file. Here's where you specify the session type the remote server, the transcript directory, whether you run as a virtual account or virtual account groups, the language mode restricted. Okay. And then, oh, there's more. Um, now, there's different um, uh, parameter sets with this. Actually, I think I've got a better slide to describe this. What I'm gonna describe is the idea of what, when someone comes in, I've described you one mechanism. They come in and you map them as a virtual temporary account with admin privileges. You'll see that there's other options, okay? But virtual admin's typically the best one. Here's what you can do. Typically what happens is this. When someone comes in, they come in as themselves, okay? And that's, that's it. Alternatively, by the way, have you ever seen that? When you go, when, when you create in a, a session, you load into a session, take a look at dollar PS sender info. And what you'll see is connected user and like connected as, anyway, you see two identities. <laughs> and typically the, they're the same thing. But in this environment, they will differ. They'll say, oh, you came in as Joe, but you're running as, you know, local root Joe or local admin Joe. Or these endpoints, you can give them main uh, accounts. You can say, oh, well, I'm going to give it domain credentials. Or in the future, it's not quite there yet, uh, you can give it a, a group service managed account or this virtual identity. Now, here's the concern and why I kind of stress this virtual account as being the preferred one. What happens here is, I don't know if you recognize this thing, it's called a blast container, right? So when the Bob quad sees something suspicious, they take it, they wrap it in dynamite, put it in this thing and blow it up, right? And the point is, it's contained. The blast is contained there. So if something bad's happening, it happens in there and not out there. So the point is, local identities keep your server in a blast container. So what's that mean? Remember, when a machine gets popped, the machine's going to get popped. And when the machine gets popped, they're going to use a tool like Mimikatz to enumerate all the credentials on that machine. If all the only credentials that they have on that machine are local administrators, well, they got nothing because they had to be a local administrator to perform that function. So getting another local administrator gives them nothing. If instead you run and you uh, use a global uh, a group service managed account or domain credentials, and all of a sudden they have, when they pop the machine, they're getting those domain credentials and then they can go off the box. The, the, the server is no longer in the blast container. Now, having been a weak point, they can attack the rest of the system. That's what that says here. By the way, I should point out, that Windows 10 dramatically changes the, the economics of this. Uh, Windows 10, coupled with the appropriate hardware, now allows you to take these secrets and store them in a protected way uh, so that this Invoke Mimicats actually doesn't work on Windows 10. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why the DOD has chosen Windows 10 and is aggressively adopting it, never before seen. Typically, they're trailing edge. But because of this one feature, well, actually quite a few of those security features in Windows 10, but this was like one of the key ones, uh, they're adapting, adopting it faster. Yeah, so you want a guy like that in a blast container. All right, so that's sort of the basics. And that's, that's, that's it. And then we've got time to go over some of the details. But before I did that, I wanted to stop and, and field any questions.
talks about um, service accounts, also domain service accounts, having SQL server, of course, actually, can the um, password stolen? Yes. Can they what? Uh, the, uh, the password of these domain accounts can be stolen. Yes, they can. So yeah, if you, if you do a run as and you give a domain service account, uh, they can get the credentials and then use them to get off the box. That's one of the challenges with them. Um, steal them only if I, in the moment, um, the service starts or? No, what happens is that the, these credentials get stored in a cache somewhere on the system. So that's what they're doing is they're harvesting them there. By the way, that's the other thing about the, it sort of doesn't matter. And you had to be local admin privileges to, to perform the function to get the, to harvest these credentials. But with the local service accounts, um, you know, the local virtual uh, accounts, they get thrown away. So there's nothing to harvest. I mean, if they were able to harvest it, they don't get anything because it's a local account. Yeah. Rami? Uh, so Jeffrey, does it make sense to integrate this with uh, domain services or the identity management solutions? I mean, you automatically generate these privileges? Uh, we're going to talk about that. That's part of the 400 part section. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's drill into a little bit of the covers. Now, so why PowerShell? What's going on? Why are we doing this PowerShell? Well, G is all about controlling the actions of an administrator. And Microsoft's strategy around admin actions is PowerShell. You know, obviously, that's why you're here. Uh, it, is, it is our strategy. We're getting great coverage. This is the way we're trying to get the whole industry to perform admin actions, OK? Now, like any other shell in the world, PowerShell dispatches commands, right? We dispatch ping, everybody dispatches ping, anybody can do IP config, etc. But, uh, and in this regard, in this regard, uh, you can control what gets dispatched just like any other shell by controlling the path, okay? What's different, however, is that PowerShell has something called command visibility, okay? Now, what we are able to do is um, you know, we are able to control what things um, get executed, not just by path, by visibility, and we control the parser. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why PowerShell has such uniform syntax, right? I mean, remember, the, for, before PowerShell, right, what was the Windows command line syntax? Anybody? Anybody? Right, because there wasn't one, right? <laughs> Some guys did uh, commandlets. Uh, dash parameter, space value, some people did uh, commandlet, uh, slash parameter, space value, sometimes it was slash parameter, colon value, sometimes it was just parameter value, some, it, was, it was just a dog's breakfast. Yeah, right? sometimes there were, okay. and sometimes there was a mix within them. What's that? Sometimes there's a mix within them, like Setha Util. Yes, indeed, sometimes there's a mix, <laughs> just complete incoherence. So what we did was, uh, we change that and we have a single common parser people write the metadata to drive the parser but then the parser is the same in fact a little 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 known fact um, when i originally started this in fact first i think if you read the mono manifesto it says version like 1.1 or 1.2 and the reason why when i first wrote the monad manifesto all the commandlets used a vms dcl syntax and so it used to be i think it was verb slash noun, might have been noun slash verbs, VMS, VMS started one way and then got confused and did the other, so I'm not sure which one I did, but it was verb slash noun, and then it was slash parameter colon value, right? And at some point we realized, yeah, you know, there's not that many VMS people we're gonna convert to using Windows, but there are probably a, little, a lot of Windows Linux guys, so why don't we just change it to a Linux syntax uh, Bruce changed about 10 lines of code in the parser, and then all the work that we had done now had the new syntax, okay? Uh, that's the benefit of having a single common parser. Now, the other benefit of having a single common parser is we get to play with it, right? We get to play with it, right? And so specifically, again, parsing is all driven off data structures that you can program. You can program. So a command tells me their their uh, uh, their metadata, and then that gets handed to the parser. But before I hand it to the parser, I can edit it. I can take some stuff out. I can add some stuff, and then I can take the result and hand it to the parser. Okay. So now the parser becomes a security boundary. Okay. 
And in particular, you can now program this to create proxies. So this combination of visibility and proxies, what allows us to secure the environment. So here's how you do it. This is the chewy stuff. Okay, you can follow along on your computer if you want. So when you do get command stop process, you get this command metadata. Okay, uh, you get well, you get command with data, and then you can pass this and create the metadata for the command line. In fact, let's do this just so you see what that looks like. So you've seen this, right? Uh, CMD. Oh, can you read that? Is that too small? It's too small. So. Yeah, I can read it on the video camera, so it's... You can? Or... Yep, I can. So... Yeah, you're lying. I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, you know, when you get some pretty good stuff on that, okay, so you get some pretty good stuff on that, but then what you can do here is... Take that, take the sign metadata, equals this command metadata. Now I've got a programmable object. This is the thing that I can program, right? So this thing, that parameters, there were all the parameters, right? So stop process, I can stop by name or ID, etc. Okay, so now put your seatbelt on here. <laughs> Check this out. I'm going to remove dot sign cmd dot sorry dot metadata dot parameters dot remove ID. Okay, do it again. Notice now I don't have an ID. Okay. Now on the attributes, this one I'm going to paste it's too long. Now what I'm doing is I go. So what I've done here is I found the parameter name, and it has attributes. Remember when you go write your, your advanced script functions in parameter, you put these brackets, you put attributes on there, right? You have the option to. So what I'm doing is I'm adding some extra attributes. And so what I'm adding is the attribute of validate set, and I'm saying the only two valid attributes, valid values are notepad and calculator, okay? And then I check, set the default parameter name to, to name. And now what I do is I create the proxy function. And this is the, yeah, okay, there you go. So now I'm going to create this proxy function. Okay. So what that says, if you're not familiar with the syntax, this is a variable uh, syntax. It says function drive stop process. Now is replaced by, and I create this proxy command using the metadata, okay? And then now, let's see, let's see if I get this right. So now what I say is, let's see, stop, process, minus name, and look, I only have two values, calc or notepad. And if I say ls ASS, and let's hope this works, because if it doesn't, we're gonna be, have a bad day, comes back and says, no, you cannot stop ls ASS, uh, the parameter name has to have one of the specified values, uh, no pad or calc, okay? So happy days, right? That's, that's pretty good stuff. However, however, check this out. Get command stop process. Well, See, the commandlet is still there. 
And so what I could do is I could say at dollar CMD minus name LSASS. Let's do it what if. Okay? So that underlying command, that proxy function calls the underlying command, but the underlying command is still there and it can still be invoked. And that's why, because if you're not familiar with this, visibility, every command with it has a visibility, and that one's public. And so all you have to do is to make it private. And then, when I try and run it, you can't run it. We have now created a security layer. Okay? We took an underlying capability, we said, we don't want to provide that in totally. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the metadata, we program the metadata, we generate a proxy, and that proxy has the same name as the underlying commandlet. And, and just to show you what that's going to look like, I'll say, let's say, what was it? Uh, I'll say, cat function stop process. What happens here is, okay, what happens is it gets the command Microsoft.PowerShell.Management.StopProcess, okay, and in the end it's going to call that underlying command. So that's what's going on. That's what the proxy function does. It calls the underlying command. Now, it does so, and then in the end of the day you say, okay, great, now I've got the secure proxy but you now have to hide the underlying command. Now you can do this all in a startup script, uh, but it's a tricky thing. And so what we've done is we've now put the, the layer, remember, this is the stuff I mentioned to you that we did for Exchange, and the Exchange has been using since PowerShell version two or version three. All we've done is we've put an alternate experience on top of it. You don't need to understand any of this. So if it went over your head, don't worry about it. This is the 400 level stuff. The stuff I showed you before is the user experience. This is the underlying mechanism. Is built in how many computers possible? Nope. No. The built in help does not make it through the proxy function. If you did a get help, you'd get it all. Yeah. But I will say that um, uh, uh, earlier, I think I showed you uh, that show command um, works against remote systems. Right? And so, you know, with show command, when you connect to a remote system, it will only show you the command that you're able to do. And when you show command details, it's only going to now you can see, oh, all I can do is stop process. And when you do that, you're only going to see uh, that you can stop it by name. And you can see that you can only add one or two values. So, show command will respect that. Okay, we have diagnostics for this. So if you go and you get PS session configuration on one of our many endpoints, I don't know if you know this, but PowerShell remoting has multiple endpoints. So let's get PowerShell session configuration. You know, we ship with a number of endpoints, and by default, what happens is you connect to Microsoft.PowerShell. Alternatively, when you're doing something like enter PS session, PS session minus computer name, dot, when you just do that, you're connecting to Microsoft.PowerShell.Session. Alternatively, what you can do is you can say configuration name and test, and you will connect to this endpoint, okay? So this endpoint, look here, it has a different ACL associated with it, right? Uh, JSON over contractor, all control, JSON over contractor one, etc. So I was messing around with that. Okay, so um, you can, each one of those endpoints has a security descriptor, sorry, a security descriptor, right? Is that correct or incorrect? Yeah, right, what the heck is that thing? <laughs> so we now have a, a nice command let it convert to a SIDL string, convert from SIDL string, where we take this and translate it into that. 
I love that command line. Because this one, you can kind of get your head around that one. No, not at all. Uh, and again, that you can use any SIDL string with that command line. We also have a new command line called get session PS get PS session capability. Here, what you do is you take a username, you take a configuration name, which are the endpoints you're going to connect to, and we'll come back and tell you this user on that endpoint. Here are the things they're able to do, and only the things they're able to do. Okay. So back to this model about how to think about security. What we said was you want to think about security exposure as capability versus time. And how uh, privileged identity management, this just-in-time management, allowed you to manage the time at which people had <laughs> privileges or had, had a, a privileges. And then GIA provided the capability. And the point we want to point out is that what you really want to do is you want to combine these two, okay? So what did I say? I said, hey, with just enough admin, what happens is, uh, or just in time admin, you don't have admin privileges, and then you go through a process and you get those admin privileges. Now that's one mechanism, okay? Now you have those admin privileges, and you can use them to use any tool in your arsenal, GUIs, any tool you want, okay? If you can do everything through PowerShell, then instead what you can do is you say, hey, I'm not going to give you admin privileges. I'm going to give you access to this other group, which it doesn't have admin privileges anyway, but you weren't in it. And that admin group is the one that I put the ACL on to give you run as capabilities. So again, you go through, you know, you still don't have admin privileges, but you get put into a group for a period of time, and then that group is the only one that gives you access to the command line. So combining these things gives you really fine-grained security. And by the way, the way, should, the way that works with, with just-in-time is you get a, a, a privilege with a timeout on it. And what happens is the system then looks for that timeout and will throw you out of the system uh, when the timeout uh, occurs. Okay, so that's, that's it. Um, we have a, a, an alias here for more information about GIA. If you have not read it, uh, Lee Holmes just wrote a fantastic blog, PowerShell Loves the Blue Team. Uh, Lee has done, everybody should know Lee, Lee's been a long time member of the PowerShell team, and since the very beginning has done just a fantastic job on security. Uh, he really just hit a home run with the PowerShell version 5 just really upping our security capabilities. In fact, you know, Lee's been working as the security architect for the Enterprise Cloud Group, and I was proud this year that we recognized that and just, uh, we don't promote people, we recognize them for what they're already doing, and so he was recognized as the security architect for the entire group, so that's quite an honor. And of course, we've got the PowerShell blog there. So I think that's it, we've got time for some Q&A, I think. Make sense? Got about five minutes. Think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you when you hit that command, uh, you know, stop process. When you try to stop others, and he told you, well, you're not to allow to do that, but you're allowed to do stop calc and notepad. Um, I guess you should remove that. I don't need to tell my attacker what he's allowed to do in this context. That's this traditional security thinking. I've always oh. found that. Here's the answer. Yeah, um, from a security standpoint, they <laughs> don't want to provide any disclosure. But from a usability standpoint, that's a disaster, right? It so it's, it's a balance between those. In this case, we decided we were going to provide that. Um, you know, like. It, like networking rules, like you try and ping something and you don't see anything, it's not saying, oh, well, you're not allowed to ping. It's like, no, I'm not even going to talk to you. And so it's like, well, okay, great, but I'm trying to diagnose the system. Is it up? And anyway, so it's a, it's a challenge. In this case, we felt safe enough that it would be fine. Okay. Oh, okay, well, we've got a few more minutes to drink some coffee. <laughs> Thank you for your time.